Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 915 for January 10th, 2022. Coming up in a few minutes. You don't actually have to find that much. You can. It's about the process of looking and asking, well, why are you looking here and what are you looking for and what would you expect to find? Um, and you can get people involved. It's very hands-on. There's no way of knowing just how many illicit stills were being used to make whiskey in Scotland back during the 17th and 18th centuries. But we do know one thing. The number of Bothy sites that have been documented barely scratches the surface. Derek Alexander is on a mission. He's the lead archaeologist at the National Trust for Scotland and is leading a project to uncover and explore more of Scotland's illicit distilleries of the past. I'll talk with Derek later on Whiskey Cast in depth. We'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department behind the label and on your voice. Well, I uh, started some controversy this week with a photo of a $1,000 bottle of Old Rip Van Winkle 10-year-old bourbon. The list price is $69.99. It's all ahead on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. A thoughtful gift is hard work. What you need is a go-to multi-purpose gift for all occasions. A bottle of Redbreast can say, Enjoy every minute, they grow up so fast. And equally nails, apologies for the back pain, I should have just hired a moving company. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Well, the holidays have come and gone, and hopefully you had enough good whiskey to share with friends and family. If your whiskey shelf is looking a little thin, look no further than Dewar's Double Double 21 Year to add to the New Year's collection. Double-aged and finished in the finest Oloroso sherry casks, this one may not last. Find it at a store near you. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. Of course, the first week of the new year is always a quiet one for the whiskey industry as people start to trickle back to work following the holidays. But we do have some headlines to report this week. Last time around, I mentioned that Kentucky had been hit by another round of severe weather last weekend. It was not until after we released last week's episode that we found out about damage in a New Year's Day tornado at the Kentucky Cooperage in Lebanon. According to the National Weather Service, an EF1-class tornado literally dropped down on top of the Cooperage site, with winds estimated at 100 miles per hour. There was damage to some of the buildings, but since the Cooperage was closed for the holiday, there were no injuries. We also have more job changes to note with the start of the new year. Noel Sweeney announced on Friday that he is stepping down as master distiller at Ireland's Powers Court Distillery. Noel is best known for his work at Cooley Distillery and helped launch Powers Court several years ago. There is no word yet on what his future plans include. Smooth Ambler co-founder John Little is giving up some of his responsibilities at the West Virginia Distillery. John said this week in a Facebook post that he'll be spending more time on the road working to build the Smooth Ambler brand, so he's turning over the day-to-day distilling operations to Travis Hammond. Travis will have the title of head distiller while continuing as operations manager at Smooth Ambler, while John will keep the title of founder and whiskey maker. And the leadership switch has officially taken place now at the Scotch Whiskey Association, where former British Ambassador Mark Kent has taken on the role of the SWA's chief executive. He replaces Karen Betts, who is moving to London with her family to become CEO of the Food and Drink Federation. Also in Scotland, we reported several years ago on the Cabrach Trust's project to turn the Inverherrick farm in Murray into a small distillery with the goal of creating jobs in the area. Now the Trust has received three and a half million pounds in grants to build the project. The bulk of the funding came from the Switzerland-based Ethos Foundation, which focuses on sustainable development and social enterprises. 
Funding also came from within the whiskey industry with grants from the William Grant Foundation and Forsyths. The distillery and adjoining heritage center will be designed to replicate the production methods that were used in the Cabrac region 200 years ago, with the proceeds from future whiskey sales to be put back into the trust for its long-term stability. Construction could begin as soon as next month, with an opening planned for the spring of next year. And finally, when is a whiskey not a whiskey, even though it started out as one? When it's bottled at below 40% ABV, of course. But Whistlepig went even farther with its Devil's Slide rye. After maturing it for six years, they removed all of the alcohol, making it a zero-proof, quote, non-whiskey. It's a limited edition, which I'm sure we're all glad to hear, and all of the proceeds from sales of Devil's Slide will be donated to the United States Bartenders Guild to help bartenders who, quote, worked their tails off through the holiday season, only to be rewarded by the January drought. Dry Januaries do have their side effects. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. Just a quick program note, our Friday night happy hour live webcasts have been on hiatus during my recovery from the hashtag concussion from hell. But the holidays are over, and I'm doing better, so it's time to get back to work. Join us at 5 p.m. New York time this Friday as Happy Hour Live returns on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. Who will be joining me this week? For that, you'll have to join us Friday night to find out. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. There is still time to make your reservations for one of Chef David Burke's beef and bourbon dinners this coming Thursday night, eight of his New York, New Jersey metro area restaurants, and his Charlotte, North Carolina restaurant are all holding the beef and bourbon dinners on Thursday night to raise money for the Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund. Bonhams and McTeers both start the 2022 whiskey auction schedule on Friday the 21st. Bonhams has its auction in Hong Kong, while McTeers will have its in Glasgow, Scotland. And tickets are still available for the National Whiskey Festival the next day in Glasgow. We have had another COVID-related postponement, and this one comes as no surprise following the cancellation of this week's Victoria Whiskey Festival in British Columbia. The Whiskey Global, scheduled for the last weekend of this month in Vancouver, has now been postponed. It is tentatively set for April 8th and 9th. As of now, the Southport Winter Whiskey Festival, February 11th and 12th, Glasgow's Whiskey Festival a week later on the 19th, and the Newcastle Whiskey Festival in the UK two weeks later on the 26th are all going ahead as planned, along with the sold-out Dram Fest on the 26th and 27th in Christchurch, New Zealand. Keep in mind, all in-person events are still subject to change on short notice, and you may have to show proof of vaccination or a recent negative COVID test in order to attend. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. Catoctin Creek co-founder Scott Harris is leading his annual Art of the Cocktail class again this winter online, and the fun happens each Friday night. You can get all the details at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com, and Catoctin Creek reminds you to always drink responsibly. 
There are three whiskeys in the Dewar's Double Double series to explore. Take, for example, our 21 year, an absolute must try for any whiskey drinker. Our master blender puts this whiskey through a unique four stage aging process, a testament to the care and craftsmanship required to make such a fine whiskey. Aged for a minimum of 21 years, this Scotch whiskey is then double aged and finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks. Dark red in color with fruit intertwined with honey on the palate, all packaged in a bottle that is sure to impress. Mark and the good folks of the Whiskey Cast team awarded this whiskey an impressive 94 point rating, along with an excellent tag when they tasted it back in 2019. Since then, Dewar's Double Double 21 year hasn't stopped racking up awards and accolades. Double Double 21 is a limited release offering from Dewar's, so you'll need to stay on the lookout. Also, keep an eye out for our Double Double 27 year finished in rare Palo Cortado casks and a 32 year finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, a whiskey that took home Whiskey of the Year at the 2020 International Whiskey Cup competition. Dewar's Double Double. It's a great way to kick off 2022. Whiskey Cast In-Depth is brought to you by Oban and the Classic Malts lineup. This week we got a reminder that illicit distilling is still a thing in Scotland. Police Scotland and agents from HM Revenue and Customs raided an illegal distillery late last month in Inverclyde, seizing 425 liters of illegal counterfeit vodka, along with stills and empty bottles. No arrests were made, but the investigation by the modern-day gaugers continues. 200 years ago, illicit whiskey-making was seen more as a rebellion against the government than a criminal enterprise— even though it was just as much of a crime then as it is today. But it was also a lot more widespread. It's believed that most farmers in Scotland were turning at least part of their grain into whiskey each year, leaving the king's excisemen to play whack-a-mole in an attempt to shut down the illicit whiskey trade. Some evidence of those illegal stills remains buried in the farmlands of Scotland to this day, and Derek Alexander wants to uncover as much as can be found. He's the lead archaeologist on the National Trust of Scotland's Whiskey Archaeology Project and believes there could be traces of thousands of illicit distilling sites just waiting for someone to find them. We talked on Zoom this week. How did you wind up getting into whiskey archaeology in the first place. I'm sure that they don't teach that at uh, Harriet Watt or any place like that. No, I went to Edinburgh University and I studied uh, um, prehistoric archaeology, but I, I worked for a commercial archaeology company uh, back in the 1990s when I was just out of university. Uh, and one of the jobs I did was, in fact, was a, a survey of the remains of the original Glenlivet distillery site. And that sort of got me interested in it. And then I joined the National Trust for Scotland in 2000, uh, and I've been working there ever since. And, and one of the sites I was first taken to see when I joined the National Trust for Scotland was on the slo- lower slopes of Ben Lomond, on the bonnie banks of Loch Lomond. And uh, I, it was the ranger there, the countryside ranger, took me up the hill and showed me at the base of this waterfall uh, a stone wall and a terraced platform a slight overhang at the, uh, hidden away and and he said well this is the site of an illicit whiskey still and I thought oh that's that's interesting uh, you know I wonder if there's anything material culture survives and whether we could get any more information out of it so that that's sort of got into it and we've been thinking I mean it'd been ticking over my head for many many years thinking about it. we tried to get some people interested in doing some work on it uh, quite a few years ago. And it wasn't until we had one of our volunteers, we do a lot of work with the public, uh, and uh, we were doing an excavation at uh, Killane Castle on the Ayrshire coast, uh, and members of the public were free to come along and take part in this excavation. And at the end of the weekend, there was one guy left. We couldn't get we couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> he was enjoying himself so much, and he was got got into. And he said, "Oh!" And he came up with a bottle of whiskey at the end of it. Said, "Thank you very much." And then, uh, uh, and he said, uh, I, "I worked for a whiskey company." And we went, "Oh, that's interesting." And he worked for Shivers Brothers and the Glen Livet. And and basically, the our paths crossed, and we decided that that's what we needed was a project on looking at the archaeology of whiskey in Scotland, both the illicit side of things and the, the legal side of things, really. So, and Glenlivet 
is a wonderful um, example of the two because it's you know it's founded by by George Smith in 1824 after the 1823 Act, and um, you know he he was a, an illicit distiller himself, so he's a sort of per- poacher turn gamekeeper, uh, and you know there was everybody in the area was a smuggler or illicit distiller. And that, at that time, and he came up against it. You know, there was he had to arm himself to protect his his new distillery from being burnt down by the the guys who were, all his neighbours who weren't very happy with him. So it's a great story, um, which is you know something that's quite. And actually, this year is the twenty twenty two is the is the year of uh, storytelling in Scotland. So hopefully, it'll fit in quite nicely as well. So that's where we, that's how we got started. And then what we did was we we had a look. I I work for the trust, the National Trust for Scotland. So we are one of Scot well, Scotland's one of Scotland's largest landowners. We own seventy six thousand hectares of ground, um, which is about one percent of Scotland. Really, uh, a lot of upland landscapes, a lot of coastal and island areas, um, a lot of areas that have previously been heavily settled uh, and are now abandoned or cleared or whatever. You know. And we wondered how many other illicit still sites might be located on our ground. So we did a quick trawl of the known records, and there was about 30 individual archaeological uh, illicit still bothies known on the trust properties. So um, we decided we'd do some survey work and we'd try and get some excavation work. So that's uh, that's that's how we got started. Um Basically, we've been doing over the last year, we got, or last two years, we got funding from uh, the Glen Livet and the Chivas Brothers Group. Um, I don't know, have you spoken, do you know uh, Alan Winchester? I know Alan very well. He's an old friend. Well, you should uh, speak to Alan because he's been out with us a lot um, doing work. And in fact, he's the sort of, uh, he, he's in, in part of the project. Uh, and has done because he knows what he's like. He's he's walked, he's climbed every Monroe in Scotland. He knows his Scottish countryside, um, so he knows the landscapes very well, and he knows how to make whiskey. And what you know, what Alan doesn't know about whiskey making isn't worth knowing, really. So uh, it's a fantastic combination uh, of you know working with somebody like that uh, in Scottish landscapes, uh, being a, you know and and talking about how whiskey is made, how it would have been produced in the past and what it might have been like. Uh, and and then, of course, bringing our archaeological skills into play as well. So we've, we've we, Alan's been out with us. We were uh, both at Mar Lodge and at Torridon. We did uh, work at uh, Mar Lodge, which is in the Cairngorms, right uh, close to Bray Mar, the trust's largest estate. And there are at least six or seven uh, illicit Bothy sites there. We've surveyed them, so we've mapped them now. And we've done bits of excavation on two of them. We're sort of waiting on some of the samples coming back. Uh, and we're um, also, we did some survey and excavation work at Torridon in sort of contrast. So over on the West Coast, um, which was a sort of late flowering of uh, uh, illicit distilling in the 1880s. Um, it was just one of these places that had we had largely managed to avoid the uh, um, the attentions of the excisemen, but they used to come by boat there and surprise the locals and uh, would go hunting for stills and bothies. Uh, and there's some cracking stories that are recorded about um, uh, distilling. In fact, that's one of the things about the project. One of the things we wanted to do is there's lots of traditional tales and lots of uh, stories about illicit distilling but we wanted to sort of try and fix it in the landscape on on real sites rather than just because you get you often get a lot of blending of stories and you'll hear the same stories being repeated and repeated and and that that's fine it gives you a, a sort of indication of what what the, you know what people went through but it's i think there's something tangible well, something nice about finding tangible remains of the actual sites um although they can be quite elusive, um, so they're quite difficult to locate and difficult to prove that they were used for distilling unless you find the actual remains. So we're, you know, we know and from an archaeological point of view the types of sites that we want to try and locate are like the one at Ben Lomond. You know, they're hidden. I mean, that's probably the, the that's the that's the easiest way to tell them apart. You know, they're hidden away from prying eyes. They're usually beside water because you need water, but not always. 
because obviously the excise men quite clearly understand that they would be located by water. So the first thing they do is they walk up burn lines looking for uh, bothy sites, so little huts where you could, you know, have a sort of hidden uh, roofed over area that you can do put your still in and not do all the workings. So there's a, you know, it's often beside water. Sometimes waterfalls are used for dispersing smoke. There's, you know, there's a talk of juniper being used because it's, you know, more of a smokeless fuel. Um, peat's obviously a fuel as well that you need. Um, so yeah, you need all the equipment. So you can't, it can't be too far from a settlement. You need to get barley and things up there, and it needs to be, it needs to be malted, and then it needs to be steeped. Um, so yeah, it's uh, and dried. So. Yeah, it's quite a long process. Looking for hidden sites is a difficult is a difficult thing. Um, there are only 130 known in Scotland located, but there will be thousands of them there because every township uh, or settlement in both in the, in the Highlands and in the Lowlands probably had access to them. You know, so they were originally being used for. Well, you'll know this. You know, originally being used for. Um, for making you know enough whiskey for yourself, sort of thing. But then, of course, when economies start to develop and you start to having pay rent, uh, and you maybe start paying rent in in goods, so you might start pay it in cheese or in cattle or in grain or sheep. Uh, but when that starts to change to um, a monetary economy, then you can convert excess barley uh, and into into money quite quickly by by distilling it. Um, so that that's that's when it goes, and of course, as soon as you start making money out of it, the government slaps taxes on it, uh, and that leads to it being driven underground. So, I mean, we're looking at this sort of upland landscapes, but there was probably illicit stills in in lowland landscapes, and they were probably hidden in everyday places, like in barns and in houses. And it's just a case that you you just try and make sure you don't get caught. Um, and it's you know it's you have to hide the equipment when you're doing it, and it takes about well, it takes about a week probably to you know to to distill quite a, a good quantity. So um, yeah, that's when you're at your most vulnerable. And it's probably fair to say that uh, most of the islands had at least one illicit still too, as well, right? I would say more, more than one. Yeah, I mean, in fact, probably the thing is you're looking at you know, I mean, Aaron, the, the recent recent work on Aaron has shown you know there are there are you know there are hundreds of stills and been being they're buying copper stills from the guy in Campbelltown who's knocking them out and selling them to people. Um, in fact, selling them to communities very often and often to women as well who were sometimes were the the main sort of brewers or distillers in, in some of the some of the locations. So yeah, there would. There really would be hundreds, hundreds of them, because it's quite small scale at that time in the sort of late. It's from the 18th century into the 19th century, and it's only with the you know you really start to get increased production with, with the setting up of the big distilleries, and that's where you know the Glenlivet comes in and George Smith. And what's wonderful about that site is it's a complete contrast to the to the illicit stills that we are excavating up in the hills um you know so it's it's effectively a farm he starts off as a farmer uh, although he would been had maybe had a couple of illicit stills hidden not on, on his farmland somewhere um and he starts off relatively small production when he gets his license um it, he builds the first distillery in in his farm and it's a sort of courtyard shape it's a sort of open sided to the north three sides of a courtyard and it's marked on the maps as old distillery and it, he basically he runs the distillery process there from 1824 to about 1859 when they then moved down the hill and they moved down the hill really to to the current site of the Glenlivet um, and they moved down the hill really to increase production and further down the hill you go the more water you can pull in off the off the watersheds so you know you can you can increase the quantity of what you're producing and that, from our point of view, that's a fantastic thing because basically they abandon the original site and they probably deliberately demolish some of the buildings and take the kit, kit out, some of the kit, and rework it, and it gets moved down the hill. So effectively, the site is abandoned, and there's one or two buildings left being used, and over time they disappear uh, until there's not a single building left on the site now. Um, uh, and when we went out to excavate it last. October there, in October 2021, we weren't really expecting that there'd be that much surviving. And this is a site that I did the survey of back in 1994. 
Um, so it was like coming full circle for me. Uh, so we we did the uh, uh, just a, a couple of trial trenches, not expecting to find too much, but in fact we found uh, that some of the buildings were preserved certainly to about a meter uh, in in height. Uh, and, the, and we came down onto what we think are the fireboxes under what we believe would be the position for the stills. Um, so one for the the, um, the wash still, probably the bigger of the two, and uh, a firebox underneath what would be the position of the um, spirit still as well. And then at one end, um, we were thinking we got bits of copper piping and the remains of a, a barrel, what looks like it's in situ. Uh, and we're going to be going back to excavate more um, next year in uh, summertime in June, July. Uh, and one of the, the the best finds that we got it was one of the volunteers that we we're working with um, found a a brass plate. It was maybe three centimeters long by about a centimeter wide, uh, and on it I had written Gottlieb patent. So it's a it's a slider for covering the keyhole for a padlock. And the, when we looked up on Google uh, what Gottlieb was it was a, a, a an excise padlock. It was a patent that was used, padlock that was used by the excisemen. Um, and it was probably for locking the, the spirit safe or or even just, whether it was an actual spirit safe, like we know spirit safes and whiskey distilling these days, or whether it was just a room where the, the whiskey was, um, was taken off, they still we don't know, but um, it doesn't get much better from an archaeological point of view of getting something that was so tied down to both the period, because it was the patent was uh, given in 1829, which you know, fits in quite nicely. Um, so we've, we've found a very similar example uh, on what well, actually was one on eBay, um, but we, we missed buying it, unfortunately. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're out there, and the, the archivist, um, Chris Brusso, has similar sort of ones in his collection for Chivas for the Glenlivet. So it was that was great. So it was really good stuff. Did you find anything at that uh, Ben Lomond site? We're going to go back to Ben Lomond. We didn't. We did a, an initial survey back in two thousand and oh, I want to say two thousand and six or something like that. Um, I, I, and we just did the uh, a map of of its location and uh, and its form. We did a little trench um, through it, but found no artifacts. And of course, this is one of the things. With the illicit sites, is that you know many of them are are actually quite clean, um, partly because you don't want to leave things lying around um, to give sites away, but also they may well have been discovered in the past by the excisemen. So uh, we found at Torridon in um, at a, a site called um, oh what is it called again a laggy do. We found a. a an illicit uh, Bothy site that had been described, had been reported in the Scotsman newspaper in 1884 uh, about the um, the excisemen who had found it. And they, ha- they had found it when it was in production. Um, but when they came back, the still and some of the, um, the other equipment had been removed and the smugglers had gone. But they found in it uh, the... Um, wash tubs and uh, the um, quantities of spirit par- partly distilled uh, and lots of different bits of equipment and they dragged it all outside and, and threw it on a bonfire and burnt it but it's a really nice description and in fact that's one of the sites where they said that there was no water, there was no running water um, and what they did was they, they collected water, fed it into the system and then let it come through uh, and it, it puddled in a small pond and then they refed it back in uh, to the into the worm tub to do to do duty again as they say so yeah it was um, it's really a nice description and it's a, a, it's a lovely location it's um, and it matches the description beautifully it's a, a natural gully against a rock face and hidden but very quite close to the settlement so there's a township within about only 200 300 meters down the hill from it, so it's not not too far away. So, so we're hopefully going back there. 
So when people find something like this, what would you like them to do? Would you like them to call you? You don't want, obviously, amateur archaeologists going in there with a shovel and just digging the crap out of everything, right? No, no, no. Um, so, I mean, archaeology is a, it's one of these things. It's a, it's a, it's a non-renewable resource, and archaeological excavation by its very nature is a destructive process. Um, so if you dig things out or haul things out, then all you're doing is removing evidence that, you know, could be better recorded or you know, sometimes it's better left in place. You know, as a specialist um, field, really, it's something you, you need to learn to do. I mean, we you work with we work with volunteers, but many of them have been working with us for years. Um, so and, and of course, you, when you find things, you have to have them, you have to th- have them properly conserved and analysed. So, we, you know, we get all the seeds and uh, all the burnt charcoal and things from the sites. We'll take soil samples and get them analysed to see what type of species are being used in terms of um, grain and in terms of charcoal type, but, uh, so for fuel. Uh, and then we're looking at, at the um, things like pottery and glass, you know, getting those recorded and analysed to see what sort of dates they are. That's, that's the, the, side, the type of thing that we want to do. But there's a lot of really good work going on in Scotland uh, with um, local archaeological societies um, who have done survey work, uh, going out, uh, you know, on field work, looking uh, at uh, 18th, 19th century settlement remains, uh, and they've recorded a, a number of concentrations of um, of illicit sill sites as part of those um, survey works that they've done. So that there's a, a group um, up in, oh, and I can't remember exactly which glen it is, uh, that have recorded a concentration of about 50 illicit still sites. Um, it will come back to me. Uh, Strath, it might be Strathconan. Um, I, I think so anyway. Yeah, I think it's Strathconan. Um, and and so, so there's a lot of really good work going on uh, and there's, been one or two bits of excavation but not that much undertaken so far so that's that's this is what this project is all about it's about marrying the physical remains on the ground with a bit of archaeological investigation from uh, excavation side of things and, and recovering the material remains which is great it's been really good what happens at the end of this project, will these artifacts that you find go on display somewhere will they wind up uh, in storage? Uh, what are you going to do with them? Yeah, it all depends. Um, some of it from the Glen Livet, obviously. It all depends on uh, what type of things that we find, where they go. So some artefacts in Scotland all belong, even if you find them in your own back garden, all belong theoretically to the Crown. Um, so you have to you have to apply for them if you want to want to show them, and generally. Um, if they're of national significance, the National Museum are likely to, to be interested. If they're of regional or local significance, you might get local museums. The National Trust for Scotland itself has, we have a large collection of whiskey related objects across our portfolio. So on lots of different uh, properties, we have little things that relate to things. And a number of our, our locations are registered museums. So we can put in a claim for some of those sort of things. So the, at the moment, there's not a, you know, a hard and fast rule about you know, what, what we're going to do with them. Some of them will be broken bits of pottery and tiny bits of glass and things like that that won't be that useful for putting on display. But fingers crossed that we'll find some good material culture that we can, we can use on display. And you know, if, it's, if it's not the physical objects themselves, then you know, having... Uh, drawings or photographs and interpretation of them might be something that the guys at Glen Livet would be interested in as well. Obviously, they are funding it, so they've just opened a new visitor centre there that tells the story of George Smith and both uh, distillery sites. So, yeah, it might might be something that they could include in, uh, on the, on their property as well, which would work really nicely, I think. Do you guys have the uh, does the National Trust own the Dallas Do site? No, that's a historic. I think it's historic Scotland. I don't know if it, it may be historic Scotland that owned. I know there's they've got one, haven't they? Yeah, they got that um, one that they were talking about reopening a couple of years ago, and I never. Yeah, heard back yeah. No, so. we we don't have any. We don't have any 
large scale distilleries as such, you know, so we've got uh, illicit bothy sites, but nothing. And of course, you know, one of our things uh, we're charged with is is telling the story of Scotland's past um, through, you know, the physical remains. Um, and of course, you know, whiskey is a huge part of the Scotland's cultural heritage. Um, so we've got a, a tiny fragment of it, but it's it's we have because we've got a sort of national overview, of, especially of landscapes. Then you know we're quite well placed to sort of look at certainly from our point of our our, our own sort of portfolio of sites, which are as I say mostly landscape based, telling that story, but also starting to ask people about you know what what's happening in in their part of Scotland as well. So hopefully. Well, and we've all, it's already started. We have we've had people emailing us saying, "Oh, I've seen a an illicit still here, and you know, I've got a, a I've got a, a copper pot still sitting on you know top of the cupboard at home. Where did it come from? That sort of thing, you know. So that that that's the sort of interest that we're hoping to to get people to to come forward with more information. So it's you know, it's a, if you start a project like this, you get a lot of people showing interest, which is great. And it brings about new interest in not only the uh, science of archaeology, but Scottish culture in general. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and from our point of view, it's good because, I mean, I, archaeology is a really good uh, tool to use for because it's great. It, it, it's, you don't actually have to find that much. You can. It's about the process of looking and asking, well, why are you looking here and what are you looking for and what would you expect to find? Um, and you can get people involved. It's very hands on. Um, so, you know, we know we can go to local communities and get uh, local volunteers to come and help us. And that worked really well at Glenlivet, where we had, you know, it was mostly all local volunteers who came along and helped. And that was fantastic. And of course, they've got their own local knowledge that will help. And that's the trouble, you know, being an archaeologist, you move around the country and you can't be an expert in everything. So you need to, you need to, you know, get people's local knowledge, but you need folk like Alan, experts in their field to come and help too. And that's, that's what's been fantastic about this project. It's, you know, it's a really good marriage of, of that side of things. Thanks to Derek Alexander of the National Trust of Scotland, and we've included a link to the Trust's website in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Oban. Every sip of Oban is like a postcard from Scotland. Whether it's the classic Oban 14-year-old, the 18-year-old, Oban Little Bay, or the Distiller's Edition, every drop comes from the coastal town of Oban, and a distillery just 206 steps away from the sea. It's one of Scotland's smallest distilleries, with just seven people who make whiskey the same way their predecessors have since 1794. Find out more at obanwhiskey.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. The Gospel It's a whiskey you have probably not heard about until this very minute. I hadn't until the U.S. importer sent me a sample over the holidays. It comes from the Gospel Distillery in Brunswick, Victoria, just outside of Melbourne, Australia. And it's a two-year-old dry whiskey, bottled at 45% ABV. The nose has touches of baking spices, honey, dried grass, straw, and dried flowers. The taste is thick, subtle, and complex with baking spices that come out slowly, complemented by notes of brown sugar, honey, dried fruits, straw, and a hint of linseed oil. The finish is long, dry, and well-balanced. This is only the second release for the Gospel Distillery, but preach it, brother. This stuff is good. I'm scoring the Gospel Rye a 94. Oregon's Westward Whiskey from House Spirits Distillery is one of those offering direct-to-consumer sales with its quarterly Whiskey Club, and the debut release is a single barrel finished in Tempranillo wine casks. This single malt is bottled at 45% ABV. The nose has notes of berry cobbler, blackberry jam, sandalwood, soft oak, and a hint of marzipan. The taste is very fruity with subtle hints of oak and spice, along with fresh berries, sandalwood, honey, and brown sugar notes with just a hint of allspice in the background. The finish is long and fruity with a nice complexity, 
and I'm scoring the Westward Tempranillo Cask Finish Oregon Single Malt, a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They're reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye at their Baltimore farm and waterfront distillery. In-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences at the Sagamore Spirit website. They're offering WhiskeyCast listeners a free virtual guided tasting. When you buy a bottle at your local retailer, a Sagamore Spirit teammate will guide you through it. Visit sagamorespirit.com and use the code WhiskeyCast, all one word, to access. Please drink responsibly. Of course, Woodford Reserve is known for its bourbons, but it has also created over the years what could be described as a couple of single malts as part of the annual Master's Collection series of releases, and the new Winter 2021 release falls into that category. It's a five-malt stouted mash that was created by Master Distiller Chris Morris and Assistant Master Distiller Elizabeth McCall. This straight malt whiskey is bottled at 45.2% ABV. The nose is nice and toasty with roasted nuts, a hint of orange peel, milk chocolate, hazelnuts, black cherries, and a good maltiness. The taste is malty and rich with touches of cooked fruits, hazelnuts, cocoa powder, and subtle spices, while the finish is long and malty with a nice touch of hot chocolate. I'm scoring Woodford Reserve's Five Malt Stouted Mash Master's Collection release a 94. And finally, let's look at the second release of Highland Park's Cask Strength Single Malt. This one is bottled at 63.9% ABV. The nose has notes of toffee, caramel candy, marzipan, roasted nuts, manuka honey, and toasted oak. The taste is thick and well-balanced with honey, toffee, subtle spices, roasted nuts, manuka honey, and a subtle smokiness. Adding some water improves it all around, with an even better texture, more spices, and some hints of dried flowers. The finish is long, complex, and well-balanced with just a kiss of smoke. I'm scoring Highland Park's Cask Strength release number 2, a 95. The one I'm tasting this week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 3,200 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. So, in Spain, they call Redbreast Petit Rocco. It's me, but a touch more exotic, kind of like a Redbreast PX edition, finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, adding a velvety and decadent dimension. You know, I won't lie, a climate like this makes me wish I was a migratory bird. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Scarabus Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. The other night, I was at a bottle shop in the next town over from Haddonfield to pick up some beer and wine, but I usually walk through the whiskey section too, just to see if they have something new. They did, but in this case it was in the display case, and it was a new price tag for their bottle of Old Rip Van Winkle 10-year-old bourbon. In the past, they have priced it at $699.99 a bottle, but now it's priced at $999.99. Keep in mind the official suggested retail price that Buffalo Trace and the Van Winkle family list for that 10-year-old is a whopping $69.99 a bottle, so that store is charging almost 15 times the list price. I snuck a quick photo of the bottle and price tag and posted it on social media with the line, There's a special place in hell for people who charge this much for Van Winkle whiskeys. Well, as you might expect, that started a flood of responses, both positive and negative. From Jeremiah Morell on Twitter, Tis but a lucky barrel of Weller. 
Too true, Jeremiah. The same weeded bourbon recipe is used for both the Weller bourbons and the Van Winkle bourbons. But the Van Winkle family selects the barrels to be used for its whiskeys. From at Stummels on Twitter, Wow, that's some really fancy flavored ethanol. Let me emphasize here, this is not the fault of Buffalo Trace or the Van Winkles. Retailers are free to set their prices at the level they want to, and there is not a whole lot that the distillery or the Van Winkles can do about it. At Bo Camaro tweeted, Is it sad that I would buy it if I could find it for that price? LOL. And John Condre tweeted this from Owensboro, Kentucky. As a bar owner, I was offered $900 for the first bottle we received. Secondary has effed everything up, and no, I didn't sell it. Then there were comments like this one from Paul at West Pacific on Twitter. Willing buyer, willing seller. There are a lot of great whiskeys that will never ever hit the shelf in my small town in rural Nevada. So if I want to taste any of these bottles, what am I supposed to do? Get your permission? Not at all, Paul. If you have that kind of money to spend on a bottle without having to worry about paying other bills, then go for it. I just don't think that you should have to pay that much for it, especially given that 15 years or so ago they had trouble selling the stuff at list price. And it's only because of the mostly illegal secondary market that prices have been jacked up to this extreme. And free market supporters like Steve Bramucci weighed in with this. Literally every commodity gets to do this. Stocks, vintage cars, NFTs. Market creates demand. Supply and demand set price. Your frustrations are you seeing the fissures and cracks in capitalism, but it's unfair to pick and choose to be mad about certain ones, in my opinion. Oh, Steve, it's not just certain ones. For instance, if I had my way, the owners of certain vintage cars would not be allowed to sell them for more than the original list price. Say, for instance, the 1969 Camaro 327 my dad bought brand new for about $2,800 back then. You can't even touch the AM radio from it for that price today. I'm kidding, of course, but sooner or later, people are going to start refusing to pay these jacked-up insane prices, and someone's going to go broke betting on whiskey prices. I just don't want it to be either you or me. If you have a question, suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world— you can always find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at WhiskeyCast. The email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Scarabus, the Isla single malt from Hunter Lang & Company that celebrates all of Isla's natural gifts in one bottle. Only those who seek shall find Scarabus. Start your search at HunterLang.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. I got this email the other day from Connor Cooney in Maryland. Hey, Mark, I love your show. I fell in love with whiskey at the beginning of 2020, pre-COVID, when my wife surprised me with a Valentine's Day weekend trip to Scotland to tour distilleries. Ever since that trip, I have dived into the world of whiskey and am working on listening to all of your episodes and touring distilleries when I can in the U.S. One thing I have noticed more of recently are a lot of whiskey companies that are starting up that do not distill their own products, but source the spirit or barrels and bottle them with their label. I have no qualms with this practice, as some of these whiskeys are very delicious. But then I got to thinking, what does it take to call a whiskey your very own, or what does it take to call something a blend? So for that, I pose this question. What is the preferred method of blending whiskey? Do blenders tend to acquire new make and blend the new make spirits, then age the blend in a barrel? Or do they blend aged whiskey and then bottle that? Thank you again for your contribution to the whiskey community. You are a true asset. Well, I'm flattered, Connor, and thank you for the kind words. Let's take a look at those questions, and we're going to focus on the bourbon side of this, if you don't mind. 
You see, whiskey is unlike any other consumer product. Nowhere else would someone manufacture a product, then put it away for several years before selling it. Honda doesn't do that with its cars, and Apple sure as hell doesn't do it with iPhones. So, for that reason, most startup brands source aged whiskeys for their debut releases, and for that matter, most of what they're releasing, because unless you're building a distillery and have the capital to sit on maturing barrels for several years, the goal is to get a product on the market as quickly as possible. We'll give you an example here. Actors Ian Summerhalder and Paul Wesley created their own Brothers Bond bourbon brand using sourced bourbon barrels from MGP in Indiana. And Ian explained the level of commitment that takes during a Zoom call with whiskey writers last month. Bourbon's expensive. You can get into gin or vodka or tequila, like every other celebrity has, very easily and quickly. Bourbon takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of freaking money. And we did it. And this guy and I, we needed to get our bourbon stores. And I'll tell you this. This is the last thing I'll say about anything dealing with financials. We were stuck and we needed our bourbon. And we raised a million dollars over a weekend in cash for a company with no operating agreement (laughs) to buy the first batch of our bourbon that we needed at the age in which we knew we would need to put it in bottles. It was one of the most stressful weekends of my life. I didn't sleep for 72 hours, but we did it. That Zoom call was to unveil the new cask strength version of their Brothers Bond bourbon. We are hoping to have Ian and Paul on the show very soon, and I'll share my tasting notes for it then. Back to Connor's question now. One can buy casks of new make spirit, and that is somewhat commonplace in Scotland, But unless you have a distilling consultant or a lot of experience in dealing with new make spirit, it's not easy to project what that unaged spirit is going to be like in a few years. Plus, you then have to deal with all the hassles of arranging for storage in a bonded warehouse, insurance, and all the things like that. Regardless, unless you're taking that sourced whiskey and just bottling it as a single barrel— In my opinion, if you actually take the time and effort to create a blend of different barrels and can then repeat that process so consumers get the same experience each time, then by all means, you can call it your own. Just don't claim that you distilled it yourself. Connor, I hope that helps answer your questions, and thank you again for your kind email. If you have something you'd like to see us look at on an upcoming episode— Just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist. A unique, triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address comments at whiskeycast.com just like the end of this whiskey cast episode doers double double always makes for a smooth finish keep an eye out for a bottle of double double 21 year and here's to a very happy new year and now a message from robin redbreast you know people always ask me does redbreast go better with ice or without would it go well with figs dark chocolate, apple crumble. Is there one particular thing I should enjoy it with? I tell them, yeah, other people. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2022, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, Please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.